Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. I'm delighted to introduce you to Sharifa Rhodes Pitts. Her first book, Harlem is Nowhere, A Journey to the Mecca of Black America, has just been published by Little Brown and Company. I think it could only have been written by someone who wasn't born in Harlem, but aspired to be there, the center of black America. The book has received lots of attention, and deservedly so. Congratulations. Thank you. Your fascination with Harlem seems to have started when you were a girl growing up in Texas. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Was it from the books that you read, or what was it? It was first from books. Um, my mother is a, a, a voracious reader, and her bookshelves were full of everything, um, especially during the time in the 70s and 80s when black women's literature was really coming into flower in America. So I grew up with those books around as if they were just, um, as if that was a perfectly normal thing, which I'm really grateful for. I know that's not everyone's experience. But it was through sort of thumbing through her books as I got older. Um, one thing that stands out is Alice Walker's collection In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, which has her essay, Searching for Zora. Um, of course, a huge figure in the Harlem Renaissance, but also a much um, more fleeting mention of the writer Gene Toomer, who uh, his, himself is so mysterious. And I think that one mention of this writer who was um, a figure in Harlem and a sort of mysterious figure sent me to the library wondering um, who that person was, uh, where was this place that he was affiliated with, and searching for those stories of that place. And then I eventually branched out and I was just searching for the works of Langston Hughes, um, Ellison, Baldwin, especially as a teenager, and also photographs looking for the, the visual representation of this place I was reading about and mm -hmm. thinking of. So then you went off to Harvard, mm -hmm. but then you wound up coming from Harvard to Harlem to do research. I don't know if it was, if it was while you were a student at Harvard or if you had graduated, mm -hmm. but you, your, your, your first tour mm -hmm. in Harlem, what were you doing? What were you researching? Well, you know, I used to come to New York a lot during college and I would always sort of find myself at the Schomburg. Um, it seemed like a sort of a treasure, treasure chest of information and because I was an Afro-American studies major and so many of my curiosities just um, are situated within the, the really complicated history of black people in America and the world, I was always going to that place um, even when it was not to do with a research project, just for my own curiosity. Mm -hmm. So that was, that, that would have been my first introduction, was walking through Harlem or passing through Harlem in order to get to the library. And later, when I finally did move to New York in 2002, it was just, um, I was ready to leave Texas. I'd gone to home for a little bit after college, and New York seemed like where I had to be in order to become a writer, and Harlem seemed like the only place I could ever think of living in New York. So when you came to Harlem this last time in 2002, was it, I know you had a job at the Schomburg, uh, um, no? I had a job with a <coughs> publisher and okay. um, a, a small publisher of visual books that was based in Harlem and one of my first projects was to um, think about a new, a new version of James Van Der Zee's photos. Okay. And that project actually didn't pan out but I, that was, um, that had me in the Schomburg a lot so it was where I was doing a lot of work, and also in the archives of the Van Der Zee collection, which are in the stu Studio Museum in Harlem. So when you came in 2002, oh, you were working, mm -hmm. uh, doing a lot of work in Harlem, mm -hmm. but with the, was it with the idea, did you have the idea of writing a book about Harlem at that time, no, or did that come later? It came later. I just came to New York with that sense of, this is where I need to be in order to make it as a writer. Okay. <laughs> um, and But it, living in Harlem and meeting my neighbors and, um, having casual but really curious and mysterious conversations in the street um, led me to write the book and to write about Harlem first. Um, people were always talking about history in the most casual ways and the past seemed very nearby. And as someone that was very aware of the, the history of Harlem and um, the importance of that, it was really fascinating to me how this wasn't just something that was um, locked up in books or in memory, but it was kept alive in everyday interactions. What did you want to do? And there have been quite a few books written about Harlem or that have Harlem in, mm -hmm. infused in them. What did you want to do 
in your book about Harlem, what did you want to do that hadn't been done before? Mm -hmm. Well, what I tried to do, um, a few things. One was to make those stories and um, histories that I was hearing by word of mouth have as much importance as uh, the things I found in the library, the things that never would never make it into a book, um, would never be considered official history, to have those kind of exist on the same plane. Another thing, um, I guess, was to attempt this very personal um, exploration of history. So it's, it's not a straightforward history book where you say, like, it's a timeline and this person and this person, but it's really driven by my own curiosities and, and obsessions and passions. So it's very idiosyncratic in that way. Um, and I guess finally, I'm always interested in, when thinking about history and writing history, is, is sort of finding a way to slip past the obvious and celebratory um, ways that we often interact with the past, which lead to sort of nostalgia that's uncomplicated. And I think I'm, I'm constantly walking this line where um, of devotion and reverence and um, but also um, some skepticism and probing questions about what actually happened or how the residue of the past is still with us. Your, the title of your book comes from a Ralph Ellison es essay from 1948 uh, in which he writes about his arrival in Harlem and says this is, was not a city of realities but of dreams. Mm -hmm. um, what do, and the, is a message of your book, is it that Harlem is, continues to be situated in a territory somewhere between dreams and reality, and is that the nowhere you're talking about? Sure, um, the Ralph Ellison's Harlem is Nowhere it was written in, in 1948, as you say. It was an essay about um, a low-cost mental health clinic that was operating at the time in order to provide care for people that had no other options. Um, and within that particular clinic and the work that it uh, did, um, and uh, Ellison really locates this problem, the conundrum of living under racism and white supremacy in America, which leads to really a, a cyclical condition. Um, and then he expands that to find the same condition operating throughout Harlem, where one is caught between um, the past and the future between uh, reality and dreams. Um, that quote uh, about this is not a, a, a world of, of dreams, but of rea a reality, but of dreams actually comes from Invisible Man, where he, that same concept is expanded upon further. Um, in my own uh, approach, I'm, I'm borrowing from Ellison to, to kind of <coughs> slip further into that nowhere, which I think has moved beyond you know, a mere psychic condition to one where we are sort of trapped between um, the dream of what could have been of Harlem, um, the dreams of the past, of the glorious um, Harlem of the past, and, um, and then the reality that we walk through. Um, I'm very interested in the sense that there's the one that we carry in our head, the Harlem that's in our head or in our hearts, or the one that is the Harlem that's in everyone's mind. If you to, to say it, that word to anyone in the world, they'd have some clue, even a small clue, of what it meant. And, how do you um, exist within a place that's so mythical? But even when Harlem was at its peak, I mean, even if you look at Harlem at the time of the Renaissance, you talk about, you know, all all the writers and the artists and the and the music and the people uh, with the wonderful clothes and the cars. But I mean, the other side of Harlem was, uh, I mean, a, a lot of terrible poverty, mm -hmm. you know, and um, uh, racial discrimination and. So there were really two Harlems, even sure. when Harlem was at its peak. Sure. And I think what's so interesting about that moment <laughs> is how people, those things were coexisting and dependent on each other because it was the situation that, that, that people lived in was what drove the dream as well, um, you know, that drove the people to action, whether they were mar marching on um, 125th Street in order to be able to have integrated workplaces or marching to... Um, to uh, force Con Edison to right. hire black people. So right. the, the, the situation, the reality led people to, to their dreams. Now, uh, your te technique really reminded me <clears throat> a lot of James Ag uh, Agee's, you know, in Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, um, where, um, you know, one thing he did in writing about these, these Alabama tenant farmers during the Depression I remember once when they were out of the house, he goes through all of their, he goes through their drawer, their dressers, mm -hmm. and he looks at the, the, the little 
keepsakes and he looks at the things in their drawers and he looks at the, the things on their walls and the things in their kitchen and all of these minute de details, he use those, uses those to tell the truth about, certain truths about the people who live there. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that that's what you did mm -hmm. uh, in, in New York. You used a lot of the details, whether they were old, of old photographs or whether you were just studying a current building, standing there looking at it, or street scenes, or signs in the street, mm -hmm. or uh, you, capturing these details in minute details and letting them tell certain truths about Harlem. Yeah, sure. I think um, often I pay attention to things that maybe would seem inconsequential, <laughs> but in building up um, a story, for instance, with the street signs, there's a chapter where I sort of go through and survey like everything you would see on the street from a real estate sign to an advertisement to a call for a boycott to um, a mysterious piece of graffiti to, you know, and somehow uh, just by scanning these things that are all around us and they're constantly talking to us even if we aren't paying attention. Um, I'm, I'm trying to create some, to recreate for the reader some experience of that sense of um, aliveness and bombardment that one has uh, when you're walking in Harlem. I often wondered how A.G. got all of the details that he did if he was not constantly, if he didn't constantly have a, a um, his notebook or tape recorder or, or camera with him. Uh, uh, were you, you seem to be carrying your notebook a lot. I always have a notebook, and if I don't have a notebook, there's scraps of paper, heaps of scraps. Um, sometimes, you know, I would just stop and write something <laughs> down, even if I didn't know uh, how it was going to be used. And it was funny, and when I sat down to finally write the book, um, you know, I sort of, you have these moments as a researcher where you just think, oh, I don't have all the material I need, and I need to go back to the library. And at one point, I just had to go to my notebooks, my daily notebooks that were, you know, could have a grocery list on one page and a phone message on another page, but then in between there would be something that would be absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. So I had to sort of sift through my own um, quite disorganized way of capturing my life. Um, and I found in that a lot of these, these uh, daily uh, and quite fleeting uh, pieces of information that then could be uh, molded into a bigger part of the story. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I, some of it was subconscious that things that I thought were not actually important when I sat down to write, they became very important. Right. So. But you spent a lot of time while you were there taking notes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> a writer's always taking notes. Right. <laughs> we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with more with Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, author of Harlem is Nowhere, A Journey to the Mecca of Black America, after the following messages. Take my hand and start a brand new day. And together as one will start to see Underneath everything we are, underneath everything we do, we are all people, connected, interdependent, united. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, author of Harlem is Nowhere, A Journey to the Mecca of Black America. You arrived in Harlem when gentrification had begun in earnest, mm -hmm. uh, and you actually at some point got involved in um, the efforts to stop the building of luxury high-rise apartments along all along 125th Street. Mm -hmm. um, your feelings about gentrification, mm. are they black and white or are they mixed? Um, it's certainly not black and white, but I think it's important to have a sort of historical perspective about this question. Um, and the most important piece of history is to know um, how Harlem was systematically underdeveloped and uh, not there were no investments made at a certain point, um, which helped lead to the, the situation where there was blight, or so-called blight. Um, in the 60s and 70s, late 60s, early 70s, in New York, the Bronx, and Harlem. I mean, there were documented cases of landlords burning their own buildings down, which then leads to these empty lots that many of them are now being filled with um, market rate condominiums. Some have been filled by, low income, by middle or low income housing, but the drive, the main drive right now seems to be towards market rate housing. 
so I think as a person who's interested in history, it's never just a question of we don't want Starbucks or, um, or this big box store, but to understand that the situation that is now, um, <coughs> that many people are desperately saying this needs to be fixed, we need more density, we need more this, um, didn't happen um, on its own. And um, the people who survived that and who sustained the neighborhood um, during times when many people turned their backs or left, I think um, it's not something our society in th these days really, it's not part of our, the way we think about civic life, but I would like to put forward that not just in Harlem, but in, in other communities where this is happening around the country, that those people are owed something, a place to live, um, a sense of continuity with their own history, their family history, not just the history of of, of bright stars and literature, of jazz, and but the everyday people that mm -hmm. made Harlem what it was. Um, so that's something I would just like to put forward um, that maybe takes a step aside from the typical gentrification talk um, because it's really about people and families who have been, um, who have sustained a place over generations. Um, the work that I got involved in was inspired by going to meetings first w just with my notebook as the observer and being asked to, to help um, organize, uh, get the word out about community efforts to, um, <coughs> to educate our neighbors about the city's plan to rezone 125th Street, changing it from a commercial um, zoning to a mostly residential zoning and increasing the density, which opened the door to um, mid to high rise uh, residences and um, very little consideration given to um, people who are the most needy um, in terms of the ho needs, housing needs of current Harlemites. So our goal was perhaps never to stop that from happening, but to inject the community's voice in a meaningful way and um, to challenge the apparatus to imagine a, a, a redevelopment of Harlem that could um, be mostly for people who uh, were working people. Um, and the idea of, I mean, there's a lot of urban planning <laughs> education that I received as a, as a result of, of being part of this effort. Um, but to me, the most important thing is always um, the fabric of communities, attention being given to the fabric of the community. And um, the mere fact of people living next door to each other who may be of different incomes doesn't create a community. Um, so it's a complicated question. Yeah. And I think it's one that is easily waged on you know, the city section of the Times or the real estate section and or celebrating like new brownstone renovations. But um, I'm less interested in that and more interested in um, the individual relationships. And I think it's from the individual relationships that people feel strongly um, rooted enough, enough and um, invested enough to make their voices heard. And um, the, the real challenge is whether or not the, the city government, um, the current um, apparatus is actually designed for those voices to be yeah. heard. Yeah. In my experience, it seemed to be designed um, to do a sort of requisite public hearing that would then um, unfold almost exactly as the as city had, had designed. Planned. Yeah. yeah. So. Now you, there are a lot of interesting local characters in your book. I'll call them characters. There are real people, but there are characters in your book, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> both living and dead. Mm -hmm. um, probably a lot of people don't know about Mrs. Matthews and the White Rose Home, yes. a home for girls, uh, uh, young women who came, moved to Harlem uh, back in 1897 and was there for a long time, or Raven Chanticleer, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had never heard of him and mm -hmm. the, the, the Black Wax Museum. Mm -hmm. um, who were some of your favorite characters? And I'm mm -hmm. talking about both living and mm -hmm. dead. Well, the ones, the two that you name were definitely among my favorites, and there were, it was just such a pleasure um, <coughs> to stumble upon their stories. Um, because, as I said before, my intention was always to try to go for the less obvious. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of colorful Harlem characters that are really well known um, to people that are, that care about Harlem. But it was just such a pleasure to be able to uh, research. The history of the White Rose Home, because it, I mean, it connected so much in a way to my own experience um, uh, coming to New York in a very different time. But the sense that 
um, there were these women in the 1920s who, and, uh, who would go to the dock to meet every boat that came from Norfolk, Virginia to make sure that any black girl getting off the boat wasn't going to be um, pulled away into a potentially perilous situation. And they were welcomed into a home. It was originally on the Upper East Side before Harlem um, became a black neighborhood, but once that move began, um, it moved to Harlem in the 20s. And the home that was established there was very welcoming and um, had comfortable rooms, uh, music lessons, job placement help, but also a beautiful library and classes in, in uh, what they called race literature and history. You that probably would have appreciated that when you moved to Harlem <laughs> into the sure. house center. <laughs> I think someone should open one up now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Harlem also seems to have <clears throat> um, a lot of um, fatalists and conspiracy theorists. Mm. Uh, like uh, there was one of your <clears throat> characters who said, uh, their real goal, talking about the gentrification, um, their real goal is to, I think you said something to the effect that their real goal is to push us all into the river. Mm. I mean, that particular, I met that man just fleetingly at, um, outside of one of the, the hearings where people were giving testimony. And it was, it was less conspiratorial than an absolute cry of the heart, you know. Um, that was particularly in the case of, it was a hearing about the, re the Columbia expansion was a separate story right. from the 125th Street. Um, and, you know, hundreds of community residents came out to, to protest. Many of them did not get in in order to give their testimony. But uh, by Columbia's own estimation, something like 5,000 uh, families will be displaced from their own expansion. So is it so conspiratorial? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a dramatic and perhaps poetic way of stating, but it was absolutely from his heart. Yeah, yeah. You also reveal some locations that are probably uh, many New Yorkers probably Harlem locations not that a lot of people don't know about uh, the fire watchtower in Marcus Garvey mm -hmm, Park. Mm -hmm. I had no idea, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. Or and as well the 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 drug addicted denizens of Marcus Garvey sure, Park, sure, you know, sure. Um, or the public square that used to be where the Harlem State Office Building is now. Right, you know? this is an incredible story. Um, the Adam Clayton Powell State Office Building that is at the corner of 125th Street and uh, 7th Avenue, which is also known as Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, or officially known as Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard since the 80s. Um, he was against the building, that, that project even going up. It was, a, it was a controversial project at the time and um, it was so controversial that a group protested by sitting in on that spot for three months. And uh, Powell himself said he would leave the country if it ever went up. <laughs> and it's just one of those um, ironies uh, of history or of forgetfulness that the building ends up being named for Came him. Up, right, mm -hmm. right. Um, in the 1920s, Harlem was considered the, the black mecca. Mm -hmm. Is it still the black Mecca? Mm -hmm. You know, it's a funny question. You know, a lot of people, I remember showing this book to one person who said, Harlem, the black Mecca, like, what a, that's Atlanta. What could you possibly be talking about? <laughs> so um, I guess a, what part of what I was striving to, to put down on paper is why Harlem still matters. You know, um, as much as a different city, Atlanta may be um, more important to the music industry or a huge concentration of well-to-do black people or um, any number of reasons. Um, Harlem is unprecedented in it, the way it, it became important on the world stage. Um, and people, black people from all over the world, um, from the South, but also from the Caribbean and from Africa came there as early as the 20s. It was always a multi-dimensional um, place and a place of the diaspora, a crossroads. And the things that took place in those streets um, the celebrated things and the everyday occurrences and the everyday people are what made Harlem known around the world and um, any other place would have a lot of catching up to do. Certainly when I went to Europe, and this was some years ago, uh, people would ask me, well, are you from Harlem? They never asked me if I was from Atlanta. Wow. <laughs> so what's your, your next book? Um, my next book uh, has always been planned uh, for years now uh, to be a, a study of Haiti and of African Americans' relationship to Haiti. I would planned to uh, start that research in January of 2010, um, right before the earthquake. I thought I was going to make a short trip to begin that research. So um, 
it's on hold a bit now, but I'm very much paying attention to and continuing with the kind of research I can do by reading, but the kind of work um, that I do by being in the world, uh, that kind of research, I, I haven't undertaken that trip yet. Mm -hmm. so, but that's the plan. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Well, we're out of time. I want to thank Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, author of Harlem is Nowhere, A Journey to the Mecca of Black America. It's just been published by Little Brown and Company. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.